What's up guys, Jason of New Age Revolution from the cave, that's right, for a Wrestling with the Past episode. And I'm sitting here in my comfy new chair that I bought from Goodwill. No, it's likely not staying down here. It might, it might. It's better than sitting on the floor. You get a better look. Uh, it's not going to be part of the living room set, but take a look at it. Yeah, it's one of these classic, classic 80s... Uh, mesh backed, I don't know what they are, these chairs. I love them. You had them all over your backyard as a kid. And sometimes you see them at like, uh, uh, you know, estate stores and flea markets and people put 50, 60 bucks on these things because uh, they're retro and they're vintage. Uh, Goodwill had it for $2.99. Bam. So this will actually probably go in my yard. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, on my patio uh, at some point. Ooh, let's get where we were. There we go. Uh, wrestling with the past. Where are we at? We're at uh, January 26th, 1985. Uh, it is the final show of 1985. I thought there was a TNT episode, but it is indeed uh, the one... So... I must be watching the TNTs either a week behind or a week ahead. I don't know. I gotta like figure it out. Um, when I when I played the TNT episode, it was the one from last week that I reviewed, um, or the last wrestling with the past that included a TNT. I had already seen, so I'm just gonna go into February, start TNT from scratch in February, watch it on the network only, uh, uh, Peacock, because the discs that I have are might be mislabeled. So anyway. A championship Wrestling is our final show of January 1985. Uh, Bruno and Vince welcome us, of course, as always. And uh, we do start off with the U.S. Express, Barry Wynn and Mike Rotundo, uh, I assume soon to be tag team champions. Uh, and they take on... I just... I, I, I paused there in my head uh, because I thought of WrestleMania immediately. So the U.S. Express lose the tag team titles at WrestleMania, right? To Sheik and Volkov? Yeah. So Adonis and Murdoch have not been seen. And the U.S. Express are not yet champions. So does the U.S. Express only have a two-month run until they lose at WrestleMania? I don't know. Anyway, Barry Windham, Mike Rotundo, taking on Gino Carabello, and A.J. Petruzzi. Mm -hmm. Look, I know that I have always talked about the uh, U.S. Express as uh, favorites of mine. And I'm wondering if it was like just, you know, a kid's memories or, or misremembering, as they say. Uh, they're not that great in the ring together. And maybe it's just, maybe, maybe I need to see some more house show matches of theirs. Because their television squash matches are quick and sometimes botchy, and um, I, they're, they're not all that great. <laughs> Barry Windham as a standalone wrestler is fantastic. Mike Rotundo is fantastic. I don't know. Maybe it's the guys that they're wrestling, but, you know, Petruzzi and Carabello are solid hands. Uh, I don't know what, what the problem is. I'm, I'm not enjoying the U.S. Express as much as I did uh, or as much as I thought I did. Um, I'm just not able to get into their matches. I'm struggling. We, we do see an amazing drop kick from Mike Rotundo, and, and it just made me, uh, it made me wonder, was Mike Rotundo a good drop kicker? You know, the drop kick was fantastic. As I saw it, I'm, and then I'm thinking to myself, what a move, you know, the drop kick is. A good drop kick. A good drop kick, the guy is, what is it, parallel. Is that it? Parallel? Yeah, parallel to the ring. I mean, he is, like, straight across, both feet together. You can't even see my feet, but both feet together. Bam. Well, you know what? Well, I really can't. Yeah. Here, let's do, uh, let's do Scott Hall and Jimmy Garvin. A good drop kick. Bam. You know, you're like that. You're right on. And uh, you think I'm going to be able to put these back now without them falling? I'm not. But I'm going to try. But Mike Rotundo got up there. You know, Jim Brunzel, 
has an amazing drop kick. All right, I did it. He gets up there, but Rotundo got up there. Great looking drop kick. And I just thought, what a great move. What a great move. I mean, there are lazy drop kicks for sure. Um, I think the Rock and Roll Express had a pretty lazy double drop kick. And in fact, Ricky Morton would land on his back after the drop kick, which is just terrible. But Mike Rotundo, Jim Brunzel, they hit some good ones. Uh, Barry Windham with the uh, with the bulldog win. Usually Mike Rotundo does the airplane spin win, but we've got uh, we've got Barry with the uh, with the bulldog. Uh, we have a WWF update. Still talking about the Roddy Piper, Cindy Lauper, Dick Clark, Hulk Hogan, Lou Albano awards presentation, Madison Square Garden deal. They are milking this. Obviously, we know why. They have to keep this fresh in people's minds because it's it's the it's the build to WrestleMania. Okay, it's the reason for WrestleMania. So they have to keep it alive. I get it. But they keep pulling this thing where they say that they don't have the footage or that they can't show the footage. Well, this one's hilarious because it has Lord Alfred Hayes doing the update and he's talking about the events of Madison Square Garden. He says something like, uh, you know, we don't have the video or the still photos, but the whole time he's describing the event, they're showing still photos. I don't know. Whatever. But I don't know what the deal was with that, that they, you know, they were they were pulling something where, you know, legally they couldn't show the footage. You know, maybe there was like a, maybe they were saying, indicating that maybe a lawsuit was going on. I don't know. I don't know. But they are, they are really, really wanting you to not forget that Roddy Piper did some dastardly deeds in Madison Square Garden. Uh, we've got hype uh, for the Boston Garden February show. I love this because it is the NW. They took this from NWA, and then NWA took it back. I think uh, Freddie Miller is the voice behind these, and it's when it's like upcoming WWF events, but it is totally done in the Georgia Championship Wrestling, you know, NWA Saturday uh, format. It's it's theirs. It like bounced back and forth between the two. It's a TBS thing. It's amazing to see, and surreal to see a WWF, um, you know, card being being hyped on the NWA style of update. It's very cool. It's neat. Anyway, they're talking about a February 3rd or February 2nd Boston Garden show, which I don't have. I don't think Boston Garden shows were very available on the tape trading market early, you know, in 85. I, I think they started becoming available in like 86. Uh, we have Rusty Brooks uh, with no strap. No strap. And somebody uh, pointed out that I, me calling it a doublet, a two-strap uh, outfit is just stupid. It, it's still a singlet. I like to call it a doublet. I don't care what anybody says. It's my show. Uh, so Rusty Brooks with no strap. Now, if you recall, in the last episode, uh, one of Rusty Brooks' straps broke. So maybe he just, maybe this was the only outfit he had. They're, they're just the, the tights. There's no straps. Rusty Brooks without straps uh, is a girthy fella. Not like the little straps hide anything, but... He just looks very round without the straps. He's teaming up with uh, a fella that I've uh, lovingly referred to as a big dopey tree trunk, uh, Dave Barbie. Uh, they are taking on Jimmy Snuka and uh, the Tonga Kid. Uh, nothing, nothing much here. I mean, the crowd just absolutely loves Snuka and Tonga. And uh, they bounce around Rusty Brooks for a little bit. Dave Barbie fumbles into the ring, gets a body slam and then takes the uh, super fly leap. And I, I always like how... <clears throat> so Snooka hits the... Snooka hits an amazing... You know, he always hits amazing-looking dives. And you got to wonder how he's not killing the opponent. But uh, hits a great move. And then uh, you kind of see Rusty Brooks coming in. And then... At, I was going to call him King Tonga. Uh, Tonga Kid just flies over Snooka and uh, Barbie and just kind of like double double forearms uh rusty brooks right out of the ring it's it's cool visual with with tonga flying in to stop and interfering rusty brooks 
Uh, it is funny, uh, Tonga Kid is only 18 years old, and they continue to reference this, but it is funny to see him, like, kind of clueless to the point where Jimmy Snuka, who's, I would assume, always clueless, but Jimmy Snuka and the referees have to continue to, like, point Tonga towards the hard camera during, you know, uh, pre-match intros and post-match you know, your winners are, you know, Tonga is like everywhere else. And so Snooka continues to have to like push him to face the hard camera during his, uh, during the winner's announcements by the ring announcer. It's hilarious. And the referee is getting involved too, push them around. It's great. Uh, we have an interview for the Boston card. Uh, Big John Stud, uh, it comes in. He's, he and Ken Patero are going to take on, uh, Andre and Junkyard Dog, I assume. Or I think, I remember, yeah, it's Andre and Dog, I believe. Uh, Big John Stud is still carrying around that disgusting bag of Andre the Giant's hair. And he continues to just play with it in his hands. Like, he takes it out and, like, has a wad of Andre hair in his hands. That just grosses me out so much to think about. Like, it's almost, it's almost instigating a vomit, a vomit reaction out of me right now. Uh, we've got, uh, S.D. Jones, S.D. Jones teaming up with, uh, Aldo Marino, and they take on Sheik and Volkov. Uh, Volkov sings the Russian national anthem, and Vince is grossed out by it. So, uh, Vince is doing his usual commentary, and, uh, you know, Nikolai goes to grab the, grab the mic from Howard Finkel, and you hear Vince just go, Oh, no! And I... I, you know, Vince, Vince has the most guttural reactions to things. You know, the, ah, oh my God, you know, and the, oh no, went to, to Nikolai singing as if, as if it's gross for him. I love Vince, and I hate Vince, but I love Vince and hate him, just so you know. During this, uh, during this, uh, uh, the, the national anthem, uh, we, we get a, a return appearance from Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo. Yeah, they come out waving, waving the American flag. And uh, that, that, of course, pumps up the c crowd and irates Sheik and Volkov. And then I always love when, like, the jobbers uh, start to go into business for themselves and start trying to rally the crowd as well with USA chants, which always ends up resulting in death for the jobbers, right? You know they're they're rallying up the crowd, and then because of the crowd reaction, she can Volkov just murder them, and then you if you're the crowd you got to feel bad, you be like oh my god you know I just got this guy killed, you know just because I'm chanting USA. Uh, there was a sign about uh, <laughs> they flashed to a sign in the audience that said Fred Blassie should be deported. And I don't, I don't get that at all. But, uh, but Vince McMahon does does the classic Vince McMahon fake laugh when he sees the uh, sign, you know the, <laughs> you know the the Vince the Vince fake laugh. <laughs> yes, sir. That's Vince. Uh, love that. Love the fake. Uh, love the fake Vince laugh. Uh, he does it a lot during the Hillbilly Jim match, which is coming up later. Uh, ah, you know, he does that. <laughs> Good old hillbilly. You know, the big hillbilly. <laughs> Iron Sheik wins it with the camel clutch, which I, I've been in a camel clutch because I was friends with a total idiot when I was a kid, and we would wrestle. But of course you're wrestling. You're not, you're not actually beating each other. But every once in a while he would get me in a camel clutch, and he would just wrench back. And I, I, was, I was dying. I was literally thinking that this was it. I'm going to die. I can't breathe. I'm just getting stretched to death. And, and I would, I would like, call for his mom. I would scream for his mom to come save me. <laughs> he wouldn't let it go. Bastard. Boston Crab, too. That'll, that'll murder you. Uh, we've got an interview with Andre the Giant. He, of course, is pumping his Boston Garden match with uh, Stud. We've got a rare George Wells uh, syndicated appearance. He takes on Paul Kelly, who is my favorite job guy up to this point. Paul Kelly uh, does not look like a superstar, 
but certainly acts like one. You know, his facials, his selling, even his offense is tremendous for a, you know, 205-pound, you know, job guy. He's awesome. And I think Paul Kelly did slightly bigger things, like, you know, Northwest Territory or something like that. Um, Wells, of course, is a botch machine, and he botches uh, two head scissors. Uh, George Wells actually going up on Paul Kelly's shoulders. But, and I don't know if it's Paul Kelly's fault or George Wells' fault. George Wells is probably too big to be up there on a 210-pound frame of Paul Kelly, but Paul Kelly's head smashed into the mat twice with uh, botch. You know, the head scissors kind of roll over, bam, the guy flips over. Uh, Paul Kelly just head plants both times. Uh, Wells wins it with the flying shoulder block, uh, you know, the whip into the ropes. And, of course, if you're a former football player, you have to incorporate shoulder blocks into your wrestling repertoire. Uh, but more than just the standard lock-up, you know, headlock, off-the-rope shoulder block, it's definitely more than that. It's a flying shoulder block, which knocks you out. George Wells just doesn't have it. And they keep this guy around till WrestleMania too, And he's awful. He's just awful. We have a Piper's Pit with Blackjack Mulligan, uh, just your usual Piper stuff. Of course, he talks about Texas. Uh, and, but he, he, he does focus on how the uh, Blackjack's barbecue segment actually stinks. And that is on Maple Leaf Wrestling, and it does stink, because Mulligan is kind of an awful interviewer. It's, he, it's, the show doesn't make any sense. He's not a talker. He's not witty. He's not funny. I don't know why they gave him an interview segment. Um... Honestly, the Piper's Pit just, you know, ends with nothing. You know, Piper's, Pi Piper's just ragging on him. And Blackjack Mulligan is doing this very old wrestling staring. You know, Piper says something that gets him agitated. And so he puffs up his chest and he looks around. And he gives, he gives Piper a dirty look. <sighs> Don't you say that? And that's how, it, that's how it went down. That's how it ended. With Blackjack just going like 1930s, you know bad guy movie selling, you know. Don't don't talk about that, see? You know, I, I'll look at you. I'll look at you, see? You're getting me riled up. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Then we've got, uh, we've got the Moon Dogs in a, uh, in a, in a, a role, uh, as, as the, uh, superstars, right? The, usually the job team. Not so much, but we got the Moon Dogs, uh, taking on Steve Lombardi, and Jim Young, uh, I love the Moon Dogs. I really do. I, I think uh, I think I would have enjoyed them in the you know late seventies, early eighties if I was watching. Uh, but I would have been fine with them as a, a real ch contender tag team in in the uh, mid eighties. I, I think they would have been great. Uh, if you don't know, Moon Dog Rex uh, was the first Demolition Smash. Many of you already know that. Uh, some of you don't. He, uh, they painted him up, they gave him a haircut, and it just didn't work. And apparently the crowd recognized him and gave, uh, you know, gave him the what for. And, and it wasn't fooling anybody. And then they brought in Barry Darso. Uh, interestingly, as Rex is identified as the first smash, the Moondogs win with the Demolition Dooms... Do uh, no, that's uh, L-O-D. That, what was it? The Demolition Drop? You know, uh, one guy is spread out on the knee, other guy goes up to the second rope, drops the elbow. That's Demolition's finisher. The Moondogs are using it. Interesting. Interesting coincidence. Interesting. Did Rex know that he was going to be a Moondog? No, he, he is a Moondog. Did he know he was going to be Demolition? Oh, I don't know. Probably not. Uh, we got more Morocco and Hawaii, which, again, th these shows are just behind themselves because... Morocco's been back. Uh, we've got house show matches with Morocco, and now Championship Wrestling is still telling us that he's in Hawaii, and his promos are saying, I'm coming back. So they're, just, they're not on the ball there. We have the Hillbilly Jim debut uh, versus Terry Gibbs, and I swear I'd already talked about this. I can't remember, of course, because these shows are so spread out. I mean, the last time I sat down and watched wrestling was before Christmas. So I can't remember, but I thought that we already talked about Hillbilly Jim debuting against Terry Gibbs 
uh, who's a perfect opponent for a debuting uh, Hillbilly Jim. Um, we've got Hillbilly, of course, accompanied by Hogan, who just steals the spotlight the whole time. And, of course, he's goofy and inexperienced, and he kind of forgets to take off his hat before the match, and Vince is, ha, 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 he's got his hat on, ha, 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 big Jim, big Hillbilly, ha, ha, ha. Um, yeah, uh, Gibbs is, like I said, Gibbs is perfect for this. Uh, a little bit of cheating offense from Terry Gibbs. You know, you start off with the shoulder blocks again. You know, Gibbs is running into Jim, who doesn't really move. And Gibbs falls over, and the crowd goes nuts, and Hillbilly just stands at him and looks around. And, you know, did I do that? McMahon. Ha, ha, ha. So you get a little bit of offense from Gibbs, and then, of course, he runs into a bear hug and quits, you know. Hillbilly Jim beats him with the bear hug, and then Hillbilly Jim feels bad, so he, he kind of checks on checks on Terry Gibbs. Hogan pulls him off, you know, no, 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 and then um, and then uh, and then they they then then of course Hogan again steals the show and they pose, right? And Hillbilly doesn't know how to pose, so he's watching Hogan do by you know the double bicep Hogan pose, and he's watching it. And then Hogan says, come on, you can do it. And then Jim does it. Okay, he figured it out. He figured out how to do the, the bicep pose. Okay, then, <laughs> then it ends with a historical interview. The show ends with an inter The main event of the show is an interview, a Mean Gene Boston Gardens promo. It's on YouTube. It's famous. It's part of the Mean Gene botch compilation or the bloopers compilation or whatever. It's Mean Gene interviewing Paul Orndorff. And Paul Orndorff is going to take on Ivan Putsky in Boston Gardens. And the first half, of, first of all, they're a very long interview. The first half of the interview is Mean Gene and Orndorff just bantering back and forth. Um, with Orndorff talking about how great he is, he flies first class, you know... Uh, he re or he rents out the entire first class, you know, so nobody else sits there with him. And Gene is just playing, playing them back and forth. And then we have the first, we have the first Orndorff botch where he says, uh, he says, uh, he says that he's got the body that women love and the body that men love to fear. <laughs> so, you know. The, the body that the women love and the men love to hate is probably how it goes. But he's got the body that women love and the body that men fear. And he's, and he's stammering and stuttering and, and is not confident what he's saying. Ends it with fear. Great. Okay. Mean Gene doesn't react to that. The next Orndorff botch is... Uh, he says uh, to Mean Gene, yeah, you know, I, I know you think I got a good body, but it don't take much for you to impress you. And, and that was off, and, and Gene just goes, oh, <laughs> you know, you know. so Orndorff botches that. But then, then it happens, then it happens. Uh, Orndorff says that, uh, he says, you know, Putsky, you know what I like to call Putsky? I like to call him Turtlehead. And then Gene goes, oh. And, and, and then Orndorff, now it's, now it's falling apart. Orndorff says, you ever seen a turtle? It's got that, that long, that long thing that comes out, and then you do something to it, and it goes back in. Well, Gene goes, Gene loses it. Gene does the classic cover up his face. Orndorff knows that Gene is laughing. So Orndorff is like, he's curling. Orndorff is desperately trying hard not to laugh. Go watch this. Orndorff knows that Gene is joking, or laughing. Orndorff knows that he just made some sort of ambiguous penis reference, or whatever, because that's how the twelfth, you know, the twelve-year-old wrestlers are taking it, which is hilarious. Uh, so he knows that it, it, he knows it happened. He knows Gene is losing it, and Orndorff is trying desperately hard not to laugh. So Orndorff is kind of curling his mouth to try to fight off a smile, and he's like, "Yeah, that's right, Turtle Head." And then he laughs, but he, he laughs as if he's diabolical. But you know that he's just letting out a laugh, right? And then, and then that's it. And then, and then the segment ends. But, but, uh, but as it ends, as it like sort of fades to black, uh, Gene looks at uh, 
Gene looks at Orndorff with the biggest smile on his face and kind of says, Who, buddy, you, you, that was, we, that was close. You know, we almost blew this whole thing. So good. So good. It's just a turtle. You know, you know, I call Putsky Turtle Head. He's got that, that thing that comes out and then you do something to it and it goes back in. <laughs> Go see it. Go, go, go look at it. Mean Gene, Paul Orndorff, botch interview, turtle head, whatever. It's fantastic. Um, I don't know. I thought it was a I thought it was a penile reference, I assumed. Um, <laughs> turtle head also <laughs> Turtle Head could also reference something else. <laughs> oh man. You know, when you have a a turtle head uh, popping out. But uh, just just go check it out. Now I'm now I'm cracking up. All right, uh, that's that. That's wrestling with the past. Uh, if you stuck around thus far, uh, you've I'm going to be doing shorts daily, and for a while they're just going to be XOX custom shorts, and then they'll just be grab a random thing off the shelf and talk about it. Shorts. Shorts have brought already uh, nine new subscribers to the channel, which is so cool. So, you know that is really. Uh, such a cool new new feature that YouTube is offering. So I will continue to do daily shorts. And some of them might be completely unrelated to the channel. And if they are, just, just you know, I'm doing something different. Don't, don't worry. You know, it might be my kid doing a, you know, the gritty or something. It's okay. You know, it's, it's okay. They, they, it brings subscribers in and it gets eyes on the channel. So, all right, that's it. That's Wrestling With The Past. Go watch the interview. Uh, I'm comfy in this chair. I like this. This is nice. Can't wait for the summer. Get my old feet up. Get the old bear going. Get the turtle head popping out. That's all. Good night now, folks.